But I want to start even broader than that because <clears throat> so often you and I are having these discussions about all things that pertain to aging. And uh, I, you know, I, I find you to be one of the most thoughtful people across the topic. So I, I sort of want to start with these broader questions about aging. Um, a lot of people have different definitions of aging. And truthfully, I'm not sure I even know how to define aging sometimes. I, it depends, I guess, on the context in which I'm asked, right? I think if my five-year-old asks me about aging, I would come up with one answer. And if I'm giving a keynote talk and somebody asks me about aging, I'd have to give a different one. Um, so what are some of the ways that you really describe aging? Yeah, so that's um, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, I would probably say the same thing that you just said, which is that I'm not sure I have a great answer and it changes depending on the situation. I think um, in the past, I often gravitated towards sort of a molecular definition of aging. So, you know, what are the types of damage that occur during aging? What are the consequences of that damage? Um, sort of a, you know, in some ways, a hallmarks of aging framework view, right? Where we, we know that things like mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere shortening, uh, uh, cellular senescence, things like that happen during aging at the cellular and molecular level and contribute to many of the functional declines and diseases that go along with aging. And, and so, you know, given my training in, in biochemistry and molecular biology, that, that sort of is the natural place where I, where I go when I think about, you know, what is aging? Um, I would say, you know, over the last several years, I have developed, uh, I think, a greater appreciation for a functional definition of aging. And so I, you know, as I start to think more and more about translation of interventions that seem to affect the biological aging process um, in laboratory animals outside of, of the laboratory into the clinic, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about, well, what are some of the functional changes that go along with, with aging. And, and we know that across every organ system in the body, we see functional declines that go along with aging. And so I've started to think more about, you know, things like frailty uh, uh, as an important component of defining aging from a biological perspective, you know, when we're, when we're talking about having an impact on health and longevity. Um, so I think it really depends on the, the context. I guess the other thing I would say is both of those definitions and the way I almost exclusively think about aging, unless somebody sort of forces me out of, out of my box, is from a biological perspective. There are other aspects of aging that intersect with biological aging, right, that are probably as, as important as what I think of as fundamental biology of aging to quality of life. So social aspects of aging, for example, are extremely important in people, especially, right, for quality of life as you get older. I don't tend to gravitate towards, you know, that kind of a definition of aging, but I do recognize that it's important. So, you know, I think I just, I'm naturally always thinking about the, the biology of aging. And, and as I already said, I tend to focus on the molecular mechanisms that drive the biological changes that go along with aging. So let's look at the sort of <clears throat> two extreme views within the biologic and then kind of try to figure out where disease fits in. So on the one hand, you referred to the hallmarks of aging and there's a very famous set of papers that have laid these out. And if the day comes that I can actually recite all of them, I'll be very impressed. But I, can, <laughs> I always have to look it up, right? But it's, I think I can probably get seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, so, so <laughs> we, you, you mentioned can a like, bunch. Who can, who can name the most hallmarks right, right. of aging, so, so Matt or Peter? <laughs> DNA damage is, is one of them. Uh, you know, cellular senescence is another. Stem cell fatigue is another. Uh, uh, protein misfolding is another, uh, telomere shortening, uh, is another, um, mitochondrial dysfunction is another, my favorite. Uh, yeah. let's see. Did I mention nutrient sensing issues? No, nope. deregulated De nutrient sensing. Yeah. Sensing. Yep. So uh, that's my seven. What, what am I forgetting? There's in intracellular communication. Bingo. Uh, and what are we missing here? I'm going to be really ashamed if it's if it's something uh, that I study. Yeah. But yeah. So we got eight so out you've of got nine. The, That's you've, not bad. You've got those. <laughs> and then at the other side, you talked about okay, let's talk phenotype. Let's talk about the outward expression within the organism and frailty is, I yeah. think, a fantastic example. 
where does disease fit into this, right? Because with aging comes right. more cancer, with aging comes more cardiovascular disease, with aging comes more dementia. And you could argue that those are functional, uh, maybe less so cancer, but certainly cardiovascular yeah. disease and dementia are very functional forms of decline. But of course, at right. their root, they have a very cellular uh, component and a very strong set of cellular contributions. Do you think of disease as basically the bridge or the link between these fundamental cellular declines and the ultimate phenotypic de declines? Um, no, I would not say they're a bridge. So I think that I actually, I actually personally tend to think almost the, the other way around, where mm. I think that the functional declines that um, often precede overt disease or a clinical diagnosis of disease um, are are probably as important or more important from a quality of life perspective as we get older. And, you know, this may simply reflect the fact that I'm getting older and, and you know, I've noticed some of these functional declines in myself, right? Uh, and I think that, I think these functional declines happen, you know, as, as I already said, in every organ, every tissue, we don't always recognize them as such unless we sit down and think about and try to, you know, list out all of the, the ways that we have changed um, as we get older. But I think, and those often happen far before you get diagnosed with any age-related disease, right? So I'm pretty fortunate. I, I turned 50 in February. I don't have any age-related disease, at least that I've been diagnosed with. Um, yet I have a multitude of functional declines, mm -hmm. which, which, you know, fortunately don't impact me severely, but that I recognize I'm not, I'm functionally impaired to where I was 25 years ago. I think we, you know, it's just a fact. Um, any 50 year old is. And so I kind of think of those as the first sort of uh, uh, ob things that you can observe that happen during aging, often way before you get a, an age related disease. The other thing I would say about disease, so there's actually two things, two points I want to make. Um, one is, I think it depends on the disease, but we really don't have a good understanding of when the pathology of the disease is no longer normative aging. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've got some understanding of the molecular cellular mechanisms that drive biological aging that contribute in some way to our risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, um, you know, sort of all of the age-related diseases that, that are major causes of death and disability. But in most of those cases, you know, there comes a point where the, the the pathology of the disease is not necessarily at a molecular mechanistic level an extension of aging biology. It becomes something different. And, and I think that's really important to recognize because one of the implications of that is that an intervention that affects biological aging, let's just say rapamycin, we can discuss whether rapamycin is really affects biological aging in people. I think that's still a little bit of an open question. Let's just say for the sake of argument that it does. It's not clear that that same intervention is going to be effective once a pathology, you know, progresses to the point that it's not the same mechanism anymore. So I think that that's a really important point that sometimes gets lost in this discussion of aging and disease. So let's let's actually double click on that using okay. a disease. So um, you want to pick one of the big three: atherosclerosis, yeah. cancer, dementia. I think cancer is a really is a really good example, right? So. We know mTOR, which, and I'll go back to rapamycin in part because, you know, it's again, something I think a lot about, but it, it actually, it's a really good, I think, example in this specific case, because we know that mTOR, which is the, 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 the target of rapamycin, right? The protein that rapamycin inhibits plays this fundamental role in, in regulating cell division and cell cycle, right? So if you inhibit in a, in a non-cancerous cell, if you inhibit mTOR enough, you will stop the cell cycle. The cell will stop dividing, right? But there are mutations that can happen that lead to cancer that cause the cell to no longer pay attention to the mTOR break, right? And so once that's happened, if that's the type of cancer you have that no longer responds to mTOR inhibition, rapamycin won't do anything to cell cycle in that, in that case. So that's a really, I think, specific example that you can point to. There are, there are you know, sort of an infinite number of other examples that we could use, but that's a really nice one because there, rapamycin will be quite effective at preventing cancer before that mutation happens. But after that mutation happens and the cell's not responding to rapamycin anymore because it doesn't sense the mTOR break, it's completely ineffective, right? 
So that that I think is a is a case where the mechanisms have changed, right? The the mechanisms that are important for preventing cancer before that mutation occurred are different from the mechanisms that might deal with that cancer after that mutation has occurred. Yeah, it's funny. This is a little off topic, but I've often contemplated this question in the context of nutrition because in as yeah. much as there's an optimal nutrition to prevent a condition, it might not be the same as the optimal nutritional strategy to treat the disease once it's present. Yeah. Um, and you know, an example of that in an extreme sense might be a ketogenic diet. Um, I happen mm -hmm. to believe a ketogenic diet is probably the best treatment for someone with type two diabetes. Uh, because sure. of course, type two diabetes by its very definition is a carbohydrate intolerance disorder. So once a person has it, you pull out the carbohydrates completely and you let them heal, right? You basically let them recover and regain their ability. You know, and, and again, we've seen that people who have been on a ketogenic diet for a long enough period of time can resume some amount of carbohydrate consumption provided their other factors are changing such as exercise. Does that mean one needs to be on a ketogenic diet to prevent diabetes? No, I don't think so. So uh, it's a little bit of the same idea, though it's still something that's unclear. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.